1 Corinthians, and uh, this morning. Look at the end of chapter 1. No, we have 15 chapters. We should get there by. But, uh, anyway, there's some really good, interesting things here. It, it's uh, on your resume. You know, you're going to, going to uh, put in for a job or not. You, you write up your resume, and we've been taught that you're to sell yourself. You're to look good as it were on paper. Uh, I have a theory. I have a theory, basically, that uh, all those resumes, when they come in, basically stand at the head of the stairs and drop them. And the ones that get to the bottom of the stairs are the ones you look at. That's just a theory. <laughs> but that's, we have to sell ourselves. And the way that happens so often is we're taught to, uh, to uh, list all your educational credentials. So, you know, I went to this public school back here, this high school, I went to this college, and that college, and I have these degrees and that degree. And, and we're selling ourselves on that. That just doesn't stop there. It wants to go on further. And they look at uh, your past accomplishments. So, you know, where have you worked before? And uh, so you give all those things, and you know, with a dishonorable discharge, <laughs> oh, honorable discharge, as it whatever, and, and you're supposed to list all of those things, those accomplishments. What are the best qualities? I always struggle with these. What are your best, and, and it's not always the best ones that I have the problem, it's the next question. What are your worst qualities? Because they want to know those things, and they want you to be able to specify what, what are your high points, what are your low points, and they want you to sell yourself. And uh, so that's the concept that you're doing. What, what are your characteristics? I added a couple more things. What are your hobbies? I don't know why they want to know that, but they do sometimes. What talents do you have? And so it's important that we put all these things up. And all of these things point to why an employer possibly would choose us over others. And that's what they're looking for. What I want to look at this morning from these next few verses of Scripture is the fact that God didn't call us that way. You can make yourself look as good as you can on paper, but God isn't looking at the paper. Not our criteria. So what we want to look at today is what's God's criteria. Choosing by God's criteria. Let's take a look at that passage of scripture. Let's stand together to honor God's word, shall we? Now, for, consider your calling, brethren, and sisters, by the way, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not true, or that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by doing, by doing, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to uh, us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Lord, bless the reading of this word. Father, we want to come to you and look at your criteria. And we would ask, Lord, that as we search ourselves, we would ask, Lord, that you would search us as well. See those areas, Lord, where uh, we just need to bring them to you. And say, oh God, I surrender. And so, Father, open our eyes, help us to see, and Lord, we want to give you thanks and praise. Speak into our hearts today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, God's calling. And we've looked at some of these words already, some of these Greek words, and I'm going to, I'm going to highlight them again, because the first thing he said was, was uh, we're to consider the calling. Well, the calling there is that same word again, it's kleos, which is, we get that ekklesia, the calling. And uh, so what that is, is it's God's dynamic drawing of his people to himself. God chose you. And so we look at this, con this concept, and well, why did he choose me? Well, it wasn't the criteria that we would to look at, but God has chosen you for a purpose. Now, I want you to know that. Uh, the, the Word of God tells us that he's given to each one of us spiritual gifts. Pastor Angel is going, is going through all of the giftings and whatnot. He has called you not only to give you spiritual gifts, but called you to get for a purpose. There is a purpose for your existence. There is a purpose for your being in Smith Falls right now. There is a purpose for where you are and why you're there. And so God has that, and it's his calling. So now what we have to do is try to determine, okay, hey, Lord, what is that purpose? And once we've discovered what that purpose is, then we need to develop that 
and deploy it, get busy, do what it is that God has called us to do in this area for the time being. The, the first word there, it said, the way we say it in English is consider. But the, the Greek word there, the, I can't say La uh, I guess maybe it looks like. Look at who God has chosen. Consider who God has chosen. Look around you. And all stare forward. <laughs> Let's try that again. Look around you. <laughs> I didn't think it was a big suggestion. Anyway, look around you. Now look who God has chosen. He has chosen people of all kinds of different, uh, different types, different giftings, different strengths, different capabilities. And whatnot. He has chosen us. But it was God's choosing. And as we look at who God has chosen, he, we now go into some, some of the uh, rhetoric that he goes into, and he says, uh, you need to consider the fact that not many, now, not many is, is another phrase we need to understand, because he says, not many, which would infer that there were some. So let, let's not be offended when we go on and say, well, not many wise. So we look around us, okay? <laughs> that wasn't an insult, honest. I mean, he was, he does have a few. He had Paul, he had you know, some others that were pretty wise guys. And whatnot. But so just want to recognize what he's talking about here. He says, so not many, which infers that there probably were some, but primarily not. So the first Greek word that he used there was sophie. He says, not very many wise of this world. And we look at, uh, we look at, there weren't a lot of doctorates in the uh, church there at uh, Corinth. There weren't people there who were learned, who had, you know, gone to, uh, you know, not only to high school, but they got their college degrees, went to university, you know, got their master's, their doctorates, and whatnot. Not many of those were chosen that day. He didn't go after the orators, those that could stand and speak out. Do you know what the number one fear is for mankind? Public speaking. Number one, over the fear of death. Some people figure they'll be afraid, fear to death. But, anyways. Public speaking. So he didn't pick the orators, nor did he pick philosophers. Jesus picked other, God chose other people. And we're going to look at that in a moment. So the second word we see there is he did not choose the dunatoi. Dunatoi is powerful. He didn't pick those that were influential. He didn't have lawyers and, and, uh, and uh, you know, a whole team of influential people, the politicians and whatnot. They weren't necessarily on his team there in Corinth. He didn't pick those people up. See, in our society, in our thinking, we would be looking at, okay, who are the most powerful people that we could have on our side? And we would go after those people and, you know, try to get closer to them and get, bring them on board in order to uh, stack the deck as it were and have that powerful influence there. God says, no, no, me and, uh, you know, says, uh, when I choose you, you with me is a majority. We don't need the rest of them. If, you know, so God has chosen those that were not so powerful, not so uh, self-made, as it were. The, the name that came to my mind is that God didn't need the Donald Trump type. <laughs> those puffed up, self-made, influential type of people that uh, offend everybody. He's doing a really good job in the States here now offending everybody. Every time he opens his mouth, he's offended somebody. And uh, it should be rather interesting to watch. And then the next group that he said he didn't pick a lot of were the uh, eugenists, or the noble birth, those aristocracy. He didn't pick the, the, influential, the influential families. Every church that a pastor or a leader goes into, one of the first things he has to do when he comes to the board is determine, okay, is this board a safe board or is this church family driven? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Uh, I know those that have, uh, that have pastored I understand totally. Uh, in some situations, you'll get on, you, you'll come on to a, a place, and the board is governed by families that have been there forever. And you as a pastor have been given the authority uh, from head office to lead. But you haven't necessarily got the authority from the board to lead. Understand? So sometimes there's those influential families that drive the thing. And they come up with some really interesting, you know, phrases like, if you don't do it my way, I'll take my money and go home. And they vote with their wallet or they vote with, you know, and, and so it can be really, really problematic. Now, I want to tell you that 
uh, Pastor Angel has done a fantastic job of keeping our board from that. He's done terrific in changing up the board every now and then so that, in fact, we don't have that kind of power block family <coughs> driven church. We've got other issues, but that's not one of them at this point. Hey, but we're not perfect. So that's what we look at. So, so there's where he's starting. So he says, Look, don't be offended. There were probably a few people on the, uh, in the church there at Corinth that wear wise by the world standards. There probably were a few there that, uh, that were powerful and influential. There probably were a few there that were of, uh, of greater means, like uh, noble birth, that kind of thing. However, God chose, we go on to the next phrases that he uses there, and he chooses the uh, agene, or lowborn. Basically, he was picking the slave class. He chose people that were, that were not substantial in means or influence. He chose those people. And it goes on from there. Says, there's another group of uh, people that he talks about, in the, and, and this is where the Greek word gets really, really something, and so I'm not even going to try it. I'll tell you it's the despised. Those people that were despised by the other people, God has chosen. We have another phrase here as, as well as those that were not seen, the non-existent. Have you ever felt like uh, you're just not seen? You just uh, the world goes on, and, and uh, if you fell off the planet, probably nobody would notice. Those are the people that God chooses. Now I looked at this and I said, "That's the B team." And there's, you know, even in a church like this, there's there's so that that we, we figured, okay, there's an A-team. Uh, there's something going to happen, the A-team will take care of it. Uh, it's, it's bad thinking, because it's not certainly not what we want to see. But then there's others that feel like, I don't know if I make it to the A-team, I would probably say that I fit in the B-team. And I remember one Sunday, oh, years ago now, uh, we had some people that came to the front, and uh, I had been preaching on, on this kind of a concept, and I, said, I asked, if people felt they were on the B-team, would you come forward and pray for these people? It was powerful. It was powerful. Why? Because God doesn't have an A team and a B team. He has his team. Period. There's no A team or B team. And it's not if you know how to pray more eloquently than somebody else. Because, oh God, is oh God, whether you pray eloquently or not. And uh, so, God was choosing people by their heart. So, there's a, I got a quote here. And... Uh, God on purpose has chosen those whom the world deems as non-entities to show those who uh, seem to be important in the world's economy that they can accomplish nothing for their own salvation because their wisdom, their power, and their importance are ineffective for this. See, God doesn't need the wisdom of mankind in order to save us. God doesn't need the wealth and the influence of this world in order to bring salvation to us. He says that was all done at the cross. So what God doing? Well, God is choosing us because he has a plan and a purpose for our lives. We go on, though. Our salvation is in Christ alone. You see, this is why I said, this is, we went on to that phrase that said that, that no one should boast. Well, we saw that, that phrase in another place, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, right? We said, it says there, but for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. If we go in and we're all puffed up with our own worldly wisdom, our doctorates and our many other degrees and whatnot, or we're all puffed up because of our family status in the community or whatever, or we're all puffed up because we have power and that kind of thing, then, then there's the tendency of mankind to point at those things and we would boast in ourselves. When we recognize we have nothing, then basically the foot of the cross is level. It doesn't matter if you came from an influential family or a non-existent, you know, where you just don't feel like you're, you can see. Doesn't matter. The foot of the cross is equal. It does not matter if you came from the uh, aristocracy, or if you came from slave family. Doesn't matter. For the cross is level. And that's what he's saying to us. The message of the cross, which to the Jewish person was a stumbling block, you know, that the Messiah cannot be, 
And I'll get Jesus not because he was he was put on a cross. And to the to the Gentiles, that's foolishness. Is the only means by which we have to be brought into right relationship with God. It's only the power of the cross that brings us to Jesus. You can't buy your way in. You can't uh, manipulate your way in. There's none of those things. It's only in Christ. And so often what we'll see is we'll see people will try to add stuff to Jesus. So as long as I have Jesus and my good works, then I'll be righteous before God. And God says, no, your good works are, you know, Jer Jeremiah 33 says, our righteousness is as filthy rags to be burned. You know, good. So all of those good things we do, if we're trying to get influence on God, it's worthless. They're to be burned. So it's all about Christ and Christ alone. Even Paul said that. Matter of fact, uh, Martin Luther, when he was uh, when he was going through the Word, when God uh, came up with his uh, his ninety nine pieces and put it on the wall, and it's uh, solo fide, which is by faith alone. And so Paul recognized that it's by faith that we are saved. The last phrase Paul uses here in this passage, in this passage we've been studying. He actually see, brings about the work of accomplishment in Christ. I've, I've marked down here for us three, three things, three uh, works that have been established. The first one is, is, in Christ, we have been made righteous. In Christ, in the power of the cross, the message of the cross, we have been made righteous. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 puts it this way. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our right standing with God is not due to our performance, but to Christ's uh, sacrifice on our behalf. There is not a thing we can do to perform to get to a place of, of being loved by God. He already loves us. You can't perform to get that. And so we recognize that our righteousness, right living, our right status with God is a gift. It came in Christ. And all we have to do is receive the gift of right standing with God. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how good you can actually remain or any of things like that. It's not about our performance. It's about his performance. He died on the cross. He now gives to us right standing with God. It's only in Christ the totality of the law was fulfilled. <clears throat> And so the law is fulfilled in Christ, and as we surrender over to Jesus, we now are in right standing with God. That is the message of the cross. There's another aspect of this, though. Because God doesn't want to just leave us there. He doesn't bring us to a place of justifying us and making us right in right standing, but now he wants to sanctify us. That word sanctify, what it means is have the world taken out of us. And so we're in that process, by the way. It's a process. That sanctifying work, yes, there is that place in time when we actually surrender ourselves absolutely. We call it the second work of grace. And that second work of grace is where we actually start to hate sin like God hates sin. But that doesn't mean my performance is stellar from that point on. But rather, that what happens now is, is that God is busy working within us, taking that old nature out of us. And that's a process of sanctification. That happens in the cross. Uh, how many have tried to make yourself better all by yourself? Yeah, that was me. And, and you know, you can white knuckle it all. I will not do that again. I will not do that again. You might as well say at least until next time. Right? That's, that's been my experience. Is when I try to live righteous life by myself, I fall flat. But I haven't got the power to do that. Only Christ has the power to do that. And so the sanctifying work. Where 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may God, the God of peace himself, sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, your soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am so thankful that in Christ, when we give our life to him, that in position we are already sanctified. Our performance is working towards that position. 
And when we get there, when we get through the gates, the two will become one. We will be totally complete. But in the meantime, our position is we are complete in Christ Jesus. But he is taking the world out of us. That's what he did at the cross for us. Redemption. Redemption here is a, is a, a phrase that, it's actually a marketing phrase. In the markets in, uh, in the Holy Land, so often what was going on here was uh, there were slaves being bought and sold and whatnot. And uh, when that happened is sometimes somebody would come and they would purchase a slave and then surrender them over and basically give them the freedom. Uh, I love that in movies. So when I watch uh, Ben-Hur and some of those kinds of things and see that, uh, who's the other one? Gladiator was another one where that was, uh, was done. The same thing where uh, a, a slave was paid for and papers were ripped up and they had their freedom. The robe is another one. Uh, so what we have there is that redemption is to be redeemed, to be our pardon has been paid for. And uh, so this is what he says, the person by whom we have been delivered from sin, the devil, hell, and the grave, uh, being justified, here's the verse of scripture, Romans chapter 3, verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption uh, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus sees every blot that is on our account. And he has come paid in full. He has redeemed us. Not only has he redeemed us from the penalty of sin, but he wants to take from us the, uh, the result of sin and how that destroys us and how that gives grounds to the enemy and how the enemy, when he comes in, just keeps pressing the buttons and pressing the buttons. And we can be free of that. God wants to set us free. And that's what that whole word of redemption is. And so when we talk about the cross of Jesus, it's not simply saying, okay, give your life to Jesus and everything's good. What he's saying is the first thing I want to do is I want to, I want to bring to you righteousness, right standing with God. Then I want to bring you through a sanctifying work. And that's going to take for the rest of your life. But I'm going to take you through a sanctifying work. And then he says, I want to redeem you. I want to pay the price of all the stuff that the enemy has against you. I want to pay that price so the enemy no longer has those holes in your life. That's a lot. That's a lot. What God wants to do for us is give us our absolute freedom. So the bottom line, the bottom line in all of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, here Paul is just getting the people established. We've got 14 more chapters to go in this letter. The first thing he says is so it is not through human wisdom or strength or worldly position that one is saved. But only through God's wise plan and power accomplished through the cross. There's our starting point, folks. But that's what it is. It's a starting point. God, in His grace, said, I love you way too much to leave you where you're at. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pay for your sin. If you will respond, and, and uh, we've had many a theological discussion about this, it talks about the path to heaven is a narrow gate, narrow road. Pathway to hell is large and paved, and everybody's just all kinds of people run on that one. But the gate to heaven is very, very small. He's looking for people to say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. Am I going along with the crowd? I'm going to take a way that seems absolutely ridiculous to the world. I'm going to follow you. And that's the beginning of an incredible journey that God wants to take us on. But is it without peril? No. No. Uh, just to ask Paul later on when he became a basket case, you know, being put down over the wall in a basket in order to get away from the persecution that was upon him. And, you know, uh, we don't have persecution here yet. It's coming, but we don't have it yet. But it could cost us greatly to be followers of Jesus. But greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. We don't have to be fearful at all, but rather recognizing that God is going to be with us every step as we continue to surrender to him. We're going to, uh, we're going to celebrate this, this morning the Lord's Supper. Here's the invitation. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, 
and who intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith, it is by faith you've been saved, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly kneel and make your honest confession to Almighty God. God in his power has given us the ability to be set free through the cross of Jesus. This morning we celebrate the meal that, rep that is represented of the cross. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who gave and loved your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all, did provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world. We come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we humbly ask. And grant that we, receiving this bread and this cup, as he commanded, and the memory of his passion and death, may partake of the most blessed body and blood. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This morning, consider the fact that Jesus has chosen you. And God in his grace and his mercy may but bypass some others in order to choose you. Did he bypass others? No. He wishes that none would perish, that all would come. But he has chosen you. Whether we feel like we're on the A team or on the B team is insignificant. <laughs> We are on his team. And his heart's desire for you is to know that you have been, first of all, made right with God. Then he wants you to know that he has you in the process of being sanctified. And you know, the thing with sanctification is, is you will only be sanctified to the place where you surrender to God. It's only as we continually surrender to Him that He will sanctify us. If at some point we come to a place where, no, I don't want to give that up, it's okay. Have the trip around the mountain. You get to, you get to hang on to that for a bit longer. And then once we get really sick and tired of that, and we say, oh God, I surrender that to you. He wants to sanctify us. He is in the process of redeeming you. <coughs> setting you free from the burden and the uh, hold that the enemy has had on your life for so long. <laughs> At redemption, he wants to set you free not only of the sin, but the guilt of the sin but also the ground that have been given to the enemy. He wants to set us free of those things. And it's all done at the cross where his body was broken. Where his body took upon, was, was put upon, he took upon himself all of our afflictions. All of our pain, and in Isaiah it says all of our illness is upon her. 
His blood was poured out. You see, only the blood of a perfect person, a perfect sacrifice, could pay for our sin. The blood of Jesus <coughs> covers it all. It's the blood of Jesus which actually has paid the price that in fact we now have freedom. <coughs> and so this that we celebrate, this table of the Lord that we celebrate right now, is more than just a ritual. But rather we acknowledge that Christ has set us free. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed upon him in your heart by faith and thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. Be thankful.